So uh, when I get asked to speak here, I was, um, I was obviously humbled speaking at TED. And so I thought about all the great talks that TED has put a spotlight on. And with what I do, which is looking at providing difference, seeing through a different lens, I thought, well, what is it that I can do that provides value that hasn't already been done before? Okay, it's a bit of a challenge. So you know what I did? I went to my wardrobe, I got out my leopard skin pants, I got my hair products, put them over here, right? I put on some 80s hair metal and I got to work. You see, my life's focus has been on creativity, curiosity, and looking at the, trying to understand the value in difference. I love different, I live and breathe it. And it, because of that, I've lived an incredible life. John's talked about something like, you know, I've recorded with rock stars, I've partied with movie stars, I've, I've done incredible things. Uh, and it's so hard to explain to people what I've done. And it's not about me. It's because I've just managed to stay in this space of, okay, being curious and asking questions and challenging things and, and being okay with that. Right? And don't get me wrong, for most of my life, people thought I was a complete insane psycho, which is actually probably what I am, but it's just now that I've got a few little things after my name, people go, oh, that, oh, that guy's got to be an important psycho, you know what I mean? So, so um, but what's great for me is every day I wake up and I've got new challenges, different people in my life, different problems to solve, and it's just awesome, right? And it's through this power of difference. So. What I wanted to do to do it today is talk about something that I, I work with a lot of people around, and it's something that I think is going to resonate with everyone here. And I think it's a little bit different. And it's called the complexity of simplicity. Okay, so the complexity of sim simplicity is quite interesting because the word simplicity is actually quite complex because it means so many different things to so many different people. Right, so there's this whole sort of like interesting irony in this whole word. And it's about seeing through a different lens. And so it's really an algorithm that I'm going to teach you, okay? It's a bit like artificial intelligence, this is human intelligence. It's an algorithm that I'm going to teach you to help you find the signal in the noise, okay? So it's help, but looking through a different lens, how do you see innovation? How do you do that? Well, you've got to clear the space. And so this is where this algorithm comes in. Now, it's a bit like the... Um, the two Irish guys that are setting up the uh, secure network, right? One guy goes to the other guy, can you be giving me a, a password with, with eight characters? Yeah, the Irish guy goes, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> 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 if you haven't got it yet, you might at the end of this talk, right? <laughs> okay, it's different lens, looking at it differently. So I want to come up with a few quotes to start my speech. Life is really simple, but we insist on making it complex. Confucius. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it. Einstein. Simple is harder than complex. Steve Jobs. Simplicity is about subtracting the obvious and adding the meanful, meaningful. John Maeda. Now, what is simplicity and what is complexity? So to me, simplicity is something that doesn't have a lot of attachments. And complexity is something that does have a lot of attachments. It's connected, okay? So why it... So this speech is actually quite different. And the reason I say it's different is because most talks are about adding information. Here's more information. Do this, do that. This talk's about removing information, okay? And so why is it valuable? Because if you can remove information, you can control the avalanche of information media that's coming and bombarding you on a daily basis. So you can control the information rather than the information controlling you, okay? That's where the value is. It's about finding the signal in the noise. So, when I was a kid, I still look like this, by the way, without a few tattoos. But when I was a kid, I was born in Liverpool in England, and uh, I'm, over, I'm just over 50 now, but when I was a young boy, I remember going to the lolly shop, it was my favourite thing, right? Liverpool's cold and I'm going to a lolly shop. And I knew exactly what lolly I wanted. I went to the lolly shop. As soon as I opened that door, it was warm, the glass jars, all the lollies were all calling out to me. And on one side was all the jam and the biscuits and on the other side was all these like chocolate bars. And you know what happened? I walked out with a different lollies, different set of lollies. And what I went in for. And so on the way home, I'm eating the packet and I still remember the very first time I did it, I was like, I don't like these. And I'd spent all my money. And so I, I walked into this place with too many choices and I was confused back then. And I came out with something which is not what I wanted, went in for. 
So who here, and you can admit it, right, has gone to the grocery store to get some milk? And you've come back without the milk. But you've got tons of other things, right? Okay, right? So you go in there, all the flashing lights, the advertising, your text messaging's going, people are calling you, and you're confused, the baby crying, and there's a TV over there, go buy my chicken, it's on special now, now, go, get me, get me, donuts. And you walk out with all this stuff, and you come in, and you go, oh yeah, go, woohoo. And they go, where's the milk? And you go, oh, oh, well, I forgot the milk, all right? <laughs> Well, you know that, right? It's like, it's this constant state of confusion, advertising and information bombarding us, right? So it happens to all of us. Some people go into a shoe shop. Oh, I'm going to get the, uh, the, uh, uh, the number nine, blah, blah, blah. And they walk out with some, like, some crazy leopard skin things or like, no, never wear, you know, and your cupboard's full of all this stuff, right? So it happens to the best of us, right? I'm sure some of you guys relate to this, right? So guess what? The internet is like that too except on steroids, right? So the promise of the internet has been built on a foundation to feed our minds with information that's easy to access. And I think it succeeded. Yeah. Interesting stat, a lot of the stuff I'd work in is around the digital media, entertainment, content space. Every single minute, 400 hours of video is being uploaded to YouTube. That's just one thing. How can we possibly figure out what resonates with us when we've got all this stuff coming at us, right? And so, sure, we have technology to help filter that. We have spam filters. We have all this stuff to help us get to a smaller point, but does it really help? Who in this room feels like they've got heaps of time? Yeah, they've got under information and control. No one bothers them when they don't want to be bothered. They can find stuff instantly. Right? It's an ongoing problem of information overload, right? And so I say, sure, technology helps, but is it enough? So when I look at some of the studies of what's happening with information overload, people get confused, they feel stressed, they feel tired, they feel disengaged, they're overwhelmed. Some people feel like seeking out information, information that's relevant to them is actually a full-time job now. Right? In one stat I've seen, people are actually online longer than they are asleep. Now this is the world we are in. And there's no point fighting it, it's good. As long as we can figure out the signal in the noise. The term for what's happening is called decision fatigue. Okay? So I believe without effective levels of filtering, any info, even false information, lies, can be made the truth. They just get spread, distributed. So without knowing how to validate this stuff, people start believing it and stuff explodes and people, emotions going on. It's like, well, has anyone actually validated this stuff? And so humans as humans, we're wired into this thing of more is better, more. So the new product, it's got to have more features, otherwise, you know, it's like the, the old product doesn't mean anything. It's like, and so we're in this, this world of more and more and more. Now, for many years, there's been lots of examples of what we call conceptual ruts. Now, a conceptual rut, when you're in the innovation space, the difference between innovation and a conceptual rut is when you have a problem and you add something to the problem, you're going down the path of a conceptual rut. When you see a problem and you take something away from the problem, that's innovation. Now, let me explain that. In the 1800s, one example. In the 1800s, East India Shipping Company. Ships were tra uh, traveling between the UK and India, trying to get goods between the two countries and the ships had three masts, sail. How do you think they made it go faster? Let's put another sail on. Four sails, four sails. Did the ship go faster? Yeah, it went faster. Woohoo! innovation. Then came along, we wanna go faster. You know what they did? Five sails. Ship goes faster, amazing, unbelievable. So innovative. Got to six sails. You know what happened? Along came the steamship. Okay, we've seen it so many times. The, uh, the disc man, woohoo, I got my disc man, it's awesome, walking around doing the moonwalk, woohoo. And then the iPod came out, Thousand Songs in Your Pocket. It's a transformative way to look at the problem rather than add to the problem. Okay, and so conceptual ruts, we want to start thinking about how do we remove. So reductionism is very powerful. It's not just in products, it's in the information that goes into our head on a daily basis. Okay, so. I want to start talking about some similar examples. Now let me start with, who here has seen a word puzzle? Like, you know, you've got a news agent, you've got all these little words on a page, and you've got to find the words in the words, in the letters. Seen all that? Now, imagine that word puzzle, 700 foot high, 
700 foot across, and you've got five words to find in it. How hard is it? That is like your digital life. People don't know it. You're surrounded by ambient noise, uh, advertising on billboards, buses going past, stuff on your iPod, calls coming in, texts, messages, and people are wondering why they're not feeling productive and they have no time. Well, I just don't have any time. I, I constantly work with organisations. I go, well, I just don't have time. And I go, well, how come you don't? I'm, I'm managing, I, I have eight businesses and I have time. And so it's quite fascinating once we go through figuring out how to fix that puzzle together. So it's, um, you know the one about the guy who's got the bragging about the jigsaw puzzle? He did my 8,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. So he tells his mates, guess what? I did my 8,000 piece jigsaw puzzle in one day. His mates go, so what? On the box it said two to four years. <laughs> so, you know, it's, 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 it's this, this, this crazy concept. But we are surrounded by data and information and it's finding the signal in the noise. That's what that means. So we've talked about spam filters, noise cancelling headphones, another good one. We've got noise around us. It's about finding the signal in the noise. Now, here's another one. Who watches CSI? True crime, come on, I do, so it's, it's okay. Like, really, am I like one of the only people that had the crime channel on 24 seven? Okay, so who's ever seen a show where they have a, an evidence board with pictures on it and like bits of string between it, right? Okay, good. So what's going on there? I call these things artifacts. And what they're doing is they're piecing them together. That shoe print, that thing over there, that tire track, ooh, that DNA, it tells a story. Once we can pull back information into value-based artifacts from all the stuff coming at us, once we can detect the value, we can see the patterns in the data that actually then help us construct things of value and really amplify our life big time. And people ask me, how can you do all this stuff? I go, I don't know. I'm just some crazy guy that plays guitar that comes up with stuff. People ask me what I do. I go, I just make stuff up. And it's very hard for me to explain that. But the truth is, it's quite challenging to sit in a space of being different. But once you can, it's amazing how transformative it is. Okay, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Who likes Raiders of the Lost Ark? Okay, all right. Okay, we're getting somewhere now. We're getting somewhere. These are my people. All right, cool. You look at Raiders of the Lost Ark through the movie lens of oh, so Harrison Ford. And I, so I said, what, what happens in that movie? All oh, Harrison Ford does this and then he gets this. Okay, cool. What's the similar storyline in every adventure movie from Tomb Raider to Raiders of the Lost Ark, National Treasure? There's a goodie. And the goodie has a piece of a puzzle. Might have got it from the father. And then on the other side of the world, there's a baddie. And the baddie's got a piece of the puzzle. And, through, and the baddies normally got 50 slaves working on a mine, digging something that's got nothing to do with the treasure, even though that's what they're looking for, right? And somehow the baddie meets the goodie. The baddie captures the goodie. And now they've got two pieces to the puzzle. And so now they've got the two, two artifacts of value. And that tells them where the thing is. So they go on that pathway, but still there's traps on the way. And so what I'm trying to say is in a sea of noise, a really powerful thing if you want to amplify your value is to work out how to figure it, how to filter the noise, get rid of things. You'll, by the, I'm going to teach you some tools to do it in a minute. And once you do this, this little algorithm, it's super simple, you're gonna, it's going to transform your life. Because I've seen it transform tons of lives, myself included. Okay, so there's a little mantra. A mantra is something that I tell myself every morning, and it's this. Everything is not important. <laughs> right? Sounds funny. It is dead serious. Everything is not important. People are focused on everything. Oh my God, did you see what I was like? Okay, so how's that helping? Um, everything clouds our life. Is it valuable? Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to teach you the complexity of simplicity. This is an algorithm to help you figure out where the value lies in your life and how to amplify your value. And it is so, so, so simple. First one, there's five processes and you can put them in any order and you can just do one. But I guarantee you, just do this first one to start with and it's gonna blow your mind and it's super simple. Okay, it's called the binary model. Zero and one, two things. Okay, now, what you've got to do is, as of tomorrow, you've got to start recognising everything as artefacts or piece of information that comes into your periphery. And what you've got to do is you've got to label it a one or a zero. A zero is information that you cannot possibly alter the effect or outcome of in any way. 
So zero is information you cannot change. One is information you can do something with. You can affect a positive outcome. It's that simple. So let's run a little test. The bridge just fell down and uh, it fell on 16 chips and the harbour's flooded. Is that a zero or one? See, unless you're a paramedic at the freeway and you've got like cranes and stuff like that, right? But generally zero. Um, uh, I watched uh, a TV dating show last night and this guy married this girl who is a completely insane person. <laughs> Zero or one? Zero or one? Uh, if you're a certain type of person, eating too much bread will make you tired. One, right. What happens, trust me guys, you get super fast at this. Now, it's not actually about the one and the zero. What happens is you start to identify information coming into your periphery, from news stories to buses. You start just becoming aware, and aware is the first stage of going, hang on a second, it's unbelievable. The amount of information, you're now putting labels to it. Instantly what happens is you start to go, I don't need to be dealing with this. And I'm not even telling you to do that, it will happen. It just happens because you start going, oh, look, that's, that's garbage. I don't need to deal with that. So zero, one, information you can do something with and make a positive outcome, information you can't do anything with. When I've run studies with groups and organisations across just doing this across a two-week period, people are saying they've got 50, 60% of their time back. It's fascinating. They're starting to watch different types of content. They're re-engaged. They start to find themselves. They're now looking for patterns in the data. They're not programmed and puppeted by media and information that is programmed by other people to make you act a certain way. So advertising is buy this, look like this, do this. That's for the benefit of someone else. And as soon as you become aware and you're going one or zero, and you get really fast at one, zero, one, zero. So I'm talking, hey, that's great, that's a zero. That's excellent. But, but, <laughs> You know, you've got to be a good actor. Oh, that's so impressive. Yeah, great, see ya. Um, but you know, you know what I'm saying, right? But, but you know, so a little bit of that comes in. Okay, so that's the, that's the binary model. The second one is great for who, who here, like, reads something or gets something and gets emotional, gets their back up, right? This is called the emo model. The, ru the rule here is when you get information, you take out any word in that information that has got anything to do with emotion. Like, hate, blah, blah, blah. You've got to get those words, identify them and delete them and then read what it says. And often it doesn't say anything. But when it does, you start to identify, you start to get better to read things. And what happens is at, you get so fast that people are spewing out this stuff at you. Like people are like, spewing stuff at me and I'm going, huh, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's so off-putting. so fascinating. And they're abusing. You yeah, out here, you do this. So great. Thank you. Thank you for thinking about me. And they're like, but, but seriously, this venom and this aggression, stuff that's on social media, it can tip when we actually trigger our emotions. It's like those words are being used to get you to feel a certain way, to create a reaction. When you can react, react without it. So a very simple trick is to remove the words out of it. If it doesn't make sense once you pull them out, then it gives you a chance to do this. Um, sorry, what was that again? <laughs> Have you ever had someone go, blah, 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 and you go, sorry, what was that again? <laughs> it's like the kettle, right? Next time it's, <laughs> sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, I'll just, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just, they just drain, right? So, and then you get a chance to go, um, it was funny because uh, years ago I worked for this company, you might know I'm called Apple, and I, I was a professional support guy for all this high-end stuff, and I'd answer the phone and people would be screaming at me, and I'd go, good thanks. And they go, what? And I just keep saying, good thanks, until they calm down. And they go, so what's the problem again? They go, tell me, and I go, this is the answer. And I got in trouble from saying good thanks. But really what I was doing was trying to get to a point where I could actually understand what they're talking about. Anyway. So rule one, by zero and one. Can I do anything with it? Can, this is a binary model. Number two, the emo model. Any order, you can just take one tool. The second one is the third one is the positivity index. And I love this because when we focus on value, when we can figure out where value lies, and value lies in negative stuff too, when we can start to piece together value, boy, 
Does your capability to earn go through the roof? Does your enjoyment go through the roof? You start, you start spreading value to the people around you. Everyone wants to be around you. Everyone wants to work with you, right? So what I'm doing when I'm working for organizations is on the fly, I'm working like a CSI. I'm listening to evidence from people. I'm looking at documents and governance and organizational structures. In my mind, I'm piecing it together quickly. I'm looking at the patterns in the data and I go, okay, this is because of this. And it's often something they can't see because they haven't bothered going through the, the, the data and the patterns. But it, you just become very, very quick at it. Trust me, I know it might sound like I'm talking gibberish, but it's, it is simple to do this. But this is the complexity is actually working through the steps. Last one, uh, sorry, second last one is, is the easiest of all. And funnily enough, most people, a lot of the big senior management people I work with, they go, it's impossible to implement, but it's called time management. And it's as simple as this. If you want to filter information, you just decide when you're going to listen to it. It's that simple, right? So I have, you know, I'll, uh, I went to Japan recently, came back. I think I had two and a half thousand emails, hadn't read. And I just post them on Facebook. I go, woohoo, two and a half thousand. Or I get like a thousand, I think in America I got like over a thousand voicemails. It was a medal to me. I don't answer them. I just think it's awesome because it's like, because uh, people know how to get me if they need to. And if I need to respond, I'll respond. But you know, it's just flipping the mind on, like, it's just bizarre that this is the world that's trying to control me, right? Last one, which is something that's a bit harder to do, but you get faster at it, and it takes a little while, is validation. And it really applies to when you start hearing stuff that actually is a load of garbage. Um, there's so much stuff going around that it's so easy to go, before I believe it, I'm just going to quickly validate it. Um, it's fascinating to me, people's learned behaviors. People get so emotional about things that, uh, and they tell me, they go, what about this, blah, 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 I go, really? I say, how do you know that? Well, big blah, 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 blah. Okay, so how do you know that? Where'd you get that data from? What study, what research, where did it come from? I'm just, what I'm doing is I'm trying to validate that you know that you, what you're talking about to me is actually valid. And I don't even have to validate myself, I'm just getting to see if you can validate. And it's not, doesn't mean that people can't say whatever they want, but for me, um, you know, as Senem said, right, my time's super valuable, right? Um, I respect, I, I, I spend time, a lot of time, I focus really hard on not doing anything because in that manifestation of me not doing stuff is how I come up with ideas. So I don't crowd the space for me. I'm that type of person. I need my space to be able to manifest great ideas and, and so to see problems. But when I'm constantly bombarded, I can't do that. So I have to protect that space, just like what Senem was saying, really resonated with me. So really what I wanted to do today is just make sure everyone is aware that we are in a time, and I'm sure we're all, we are aware, we're in a time of information overload. And what school or what methodology is teaching you the tools to learn to filter it? I don't know. And the work I do, I start with a couple of tools when I'm working with people or organisations and it's about we've got to get a baseline together here before we do any work, right? We've got to get people to understand. We've got to get connection going. We've got to get passion. We've got to get aspiration. We've got to get engagement going. For without that, we're just doing stuff. Now, if stuff excites you, that's great, but it doesn't excite me. Okay, so that's my speech. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>